this is Tord. So welcome back everyone to another Friday afternoon DAMP LIFD UK Fluid Network and JFM webinars. We continue this week with our early career researchers presentations as part of the uh, GK uh, Bachelor uh, Centenary Seminars. Uh, a few uh, notes uh, before we start, uh, 26th of May, um, uh, there is a two hour webinar uh, uh, also celebrating the journal flow, publishing its first, uh, very first articles. In fact, uh, Kathleen will post the links in the chat, I guess, soon, and you can find more information there. Uh, also, before I forget, uh, the seminars are recorded, so please turn your videos off if you don't want to be seen. Uh, and if you have any questions for the speakers, please write them in the chat, and I will ask the questions in the end. Uh, today we have two speakers, uh, George and uh, Xiang Yang. Uh, our first speaker is uh, George Fortune. George is currently a PhD student in DAMT uh, in, at the University of Cambridge, uh, working in the group of Ray Goldstein. His research includes uh, biophysical topics mostly, such as hydrogen swelling, bacterial uh, biofilms, and also collective motions. And today he's going to talk about dancing worms. Uh, so George, the floor is all yours. Okay, and thank you everyone for coming and thank you for the organizers for inviting me to speak in this webinar series. Today, I want to bring to your attention the wonderful collective motion which is exhibited by the plant animal worm Sigmundsera wasclafensis. My talk will take place in three distinct parts. In the first part, I will introduce this phenomena and then present some background modeling. In the second part, I will then present a model for the fourth phenomena before linking it back to experiments in the third part. Okay, so collective motion, namely the tendency of many organisms when they are together to locally interact with each other and hence produce structures on a wider scale is everywhere in nature, from large lamp scales like the flocking of birds and the shoaling of fish to small lamp scales like the swirling of bacteria. A particularly interesting sub-aspect of collective motion is circular milling, namely those, the subset of those phenomena where the organisms travel in closed orbits of circular character. For example, as we see in this video, we have a number of shoveler ducks which are swimming in a circle. Their motion induces a fluid flow which drags nutrients from the bottom of a pond or lake up to the surface for them to feed on. Now, in general, when one wants to think about a suitable model organism in order to investigate these phenomena, one has to be careful about the length scale of the um, phenomena in question. Extreme length scales pose experimental um, problems or things to be overcome. For instance, at a very small scale, the field of view you need is very small and hence you need to use microscopy. On contrast, at very large lamp scales, e.g. the shoveler dots, one requires a very large field of view and then one would have to use drone technology. Furthermore, at small lamp scales, the organisms are typically quite simple and thus most of the physical processes involved are passive, i.e. I go left because the flow pushes me left. Alternatively, at large lamp scales, most of the processes are active, i.e. I go left because I want to go left. In this seminar, I want to present to you a phenomena at the centimetre lamp scale. Not only is this really experimentally tractable, for I can see the phenomena with my naked eye, but it's small enough I can fit it all within the kind confines of a petri dish, but it's at an intermediate lamp scale which allows a beautiful interplay between a whole number of passive and active physical processes. Okay, so the plant animal worm, Sigmundsera wasclafensis, is a marine aceo which is found on the beaches of northern Europe. A couple of millimetres long, it has been studied for over 100 years by biologists due to a symbiosis with the marine alga Tetrasalmus convolutia. Indeed, the reason why it is green is that within an adult worm, there is approximately 40,000 algae which are living on the surface of its skin. The algae photosynthesize and produce nutrients which the worms feed on. 
However, what we're interested today is to the phenomena of when you put a large number of these organisms together, be that on the beach, in a rock pool, or in the lab in a petri dish, we get the spontaneous formation of these wonderful circular milling structures. A couple of centimetres in radius, they can last for many hours. Now clearly, these structures consisting of many thousands of worms are incredibly rich and complex. However, what I want to get across today is by using simple mathematical models, one can gain real insight, not only physical, but also biological. Now first, we need to understand a bit about how does an individual worm move. Now they locomote through the agitation of 20 micron long cilia, hair-like appendages, which are all the way along their body. Thus, we model the, a worm moving as a spheroidal elongated squirmer, which is moving due to an induced surface velocity field. Hence, what we find is that in the far field, the fluid velocity field which they induce is of this form, namely the superposition of a source dipole term and a Stokes quadrupole term. What's really cool about this is that this flow field decays like one over r cubed rather than the classic one over r squared, which one would expect from say bacterial locomotion. This is because the front back symmetry of a worm colludes the stressless component. Okay, so now using this, we can begin to start thinking about how we could model a circular mill. One way is to consider a circular mill as a superposition of many hoops of worms, with in each hoop, the worms are traveling in a circular condo line from head to toe. From using the results of a previous slide, we can show that the fluid velocity field induced by an individual hoop is azimuthal and hence the total fluid velocity field produced by the circular mill, being the superposition of many hoops, is also as a move on. Alternatively, another picture is to consider a circular mill as a single object, namely an, elong an oblate sauroidal squirmer which is rotating with swirl. Using a very similar approach to a previous slide, we can find that when one places this object unconfined in 3D space, then the resultant far field fluid velocity field is of this form, namely a wobbler dipole. Furthermore, when one places this in vertical confinement, namely between a bottom rigid boundary and a top free surface, as you would find in say a petri dish, then after fun algebraic interlude through the wonders of uh, the method of images, um, Hankel transforms and contour integration, we end up with this resulting um, fluid velocity field. I.e., regardless of what horizontal boundary conditions I impose, the flow will have z-dependence of a form sine of pi z over 2h. And as a quick sanity check, when z is zero, this sine term is zero, which is what we'd expect from no slip. Similarly, when Z is H, the derivative of a sign is a cos, and the cos of that is zero, which is again satisfies what we'd expect to be an, uh, um, a free surface boundary condition. Okay, so now using these results, we are now in the position to think about how to model a circular mill in its entirety, namely when it is not only vertically but also horizontally confined. For mathematical simplicity, we will consider the simplest model for a mill, namely, as you see in this diagram, a rotating disk of radius C, height D, a distance B away from the center of a petri dish of radius one, filled with water of a height H. And importantly, as I will come on to later, I define a local coordinate system in the frame of a mill, x, y, z, where x lies on the line between the centre of a mill and the centre of a petri dish, z is in the vertical and y is perpendicular to x and z. From primarily experiments, we can compute that the Reynolds number for the locomotion of an individual worm is about a third. 
So hence, it means that a suitable assumption for this flow is 3D Stokes equations, which using the fact that we know what the Z dependence is, means that we get a result in Brickman-like equation, where as in screened electrostatics, we have an effective screening length kappa. Furthermore, we can define a stream, a state stream function so that we get the, which satisfies the biharmonic operator on phi is a constant times Laplacian on phi, with corresponding boundary conditions as you see here, namely no slip at the arena edge and a constant velocity boundary condition at the surface of a mill, where note we have used the, the resort we showed earlier that the flow generated by a circular mill, the fluid flow um, locally is azimuthal. Okay, so um, what we find mathematically is that this exhibits the following separable solution. Furthermore, we can compute the force which a flow exerts on the mill. And what we find is the X component is zero. I again thinking about how we defined what X was, what we see is that the um, this viscous force causes the mill to orbit on a circle which is centered the middle of a petri dish. Now it's not possible to make further analytic progress. However, in a particular couple of cases, we can make further progress. For instance, when the mill is at the center of a petri dish, we find that the fluid flow um, takes this, reduces to have this simple form where I and K are just modified Bessel functions. What's really interesting is that when we plot it as a function of R, we see that our black Brickman equation or solution decays much quicker away from the center of a mill than the corresponding blue QX solution, which one would expect from purely 2D flow. I.e. the fact that we have a height of water, even though it's a very small height of water, really does matter. I.e. the fact that we have three dimensionality really does matter. This isn't just a 2D fluid mechanics problem. Alternatively, when the circular mill is a distance away from the center of a petri dish, what we find is that the biharmonic term dominates I at leading order, the governing equations reduced to be just the biharmonic operator acting on phi is zero. And hence, moving to a bipolar coordinate system, it's possible to write down a full analytic solution for the fluid flow. And what we find is that there is two regimes. When the circular mill is quite close to the center of a petri dish, i.e. in regime A, we find that we have spherical streamlines. Well, when the circular mill is further away from the center of a petri dish, i.e. in regime B, we find that we have a stagnation point, as you can see here, namely a point where we have zero flow. Furthermore, we can compute the uh, analytic form for the viscous force which a flow exerts on the mill. And what we find is that for fit B, there is a critical radius for the mill, C star, where when C is less than C star, then the force that the flow exerts on the mill, Fy, is negative. I thinking about how we defined the um, where, how, Y points, what we see that the mill orbits anti-clockwise. While when C is greater than C star, Fy is positive, which means that the mill orbits clockwise. Okay, so now we have a number of quite interesting theoretical predictions. In particular, we note that B should be constant, while the direction of um, drift of the circular mill should be a function of a radius of the circular mill C. So hence, the next logical stage is for us to match to its balance. In summer 2019, I have a last summer before the pandemic, I went we went to Guernsey, which, which essentially is like Northern France, but you can get to it on a British passport easily. And we did a large number of um, experiments where we took a large number of worms which formed um, a circular mill, and then we tracked this trajectory as a function of time. And here I plotted two such experiments, one in A and B and one in C and D. 
Now in A and C, I have plotted the location of the centre of a mill, where light blue denotes early time and dark blue points denote later time. While in B and D, I have plotted the, um, the distance B of the centre of the circular mill from the centre of the petri dish in orange, the radius of the mill C in green, and I have plotted C star with critical radius as a dashed red line. So the first thing to note is that B is in fact roughly constant, which is encouraging. Secondly, if we look for the first experiment in A and B, C is always less than C star. So hence, from a previous slide, the circular mill should orbit anticlockwise, which is what we see in diagram A. Alternatively, in the second experiment, we see that C oscillates both above and below C star. So thus we'd expect on average there should be no net drift of the mill center, which is what we see in diagram C, which is again encouraging. Okay, so now all I've talked about so far have been has been the simplest possible situation, i.e., a single circular mill in a circular petri dish. However, experimentally, we see that we actually see much more complex structures. For instance, on the left, um, you see um, experimentally in a rock pool, um, a binary circular mill system, and we have two different circular mills. While in, on the right-hand side, um, what we did, we had a big tray, and we put a large number of worms in it, and you saw the formation of a large number of circular mills. Now, clearly, uh, this is much more complicated situation to mathematically model, but just from the modeling work we've done so far, we can gain a real insight. And in particular, so, so experimentally, we tracked a large number of systems where we saw um, two different circular mills. And what we saw was some very intriguing results. And in particular, if, if the first circular mill forms, and it is, in, it is close enough to the centre of the petri dish, so it is in regime A, i.e. Um, the flow generated has purely circular streamlines and it has no stagnation point, then we do not see the emergence of a second mill, i.e. it is stable to the formation of multiple mills. Alternatively, if the first circular mill which forms is far enough away from the centre of a petri dish that the flow generated has a stagnation point, then we can get subsequent mills, but we only get subsequent mills which form in the region around that stagnation point. Well, to put it another way, I would like to draw your attention to this slide, which gives three different experiments. And in all cases, the second dark green circular mill with corresponding blue streamlines forms in the stagnation region given by the red streamlines of the flow generated by the light green first mill. Okay, so what have I shown in this talk? I hope I've conveyed that in order to understand this wonderful and um, collective behaviour, one has to really understand the underlying fluid dynamics of this system. And what we see is that this fluid velocity field allows nutrient circulation, as well as providing a very effective method to disperse waste products away from the main body of worms. Also, as I've shown you in the previous slide, we see that this flow generates stagnation points, and thus this allows the worm population to passively organize towards the arena center without needing to know the exact extent and nature of the domain. And typically on the beach, the arena center will be much less shaded and much more resource rich. Now I'm conscious that during this talk, I've skipped over a couple of the more algebraic parts, and if you want to see the full details, then I'd like to point you at the corresponding paper, which was in a special JFM volume. And I would like to find, firstly, my collaborators from the University of Bristol, Nigel France, Anna Sandova France, and Alan Worley, with which whom I went in summer 2019 to Guernsey to carry out these experiments in the field. Or really, as someone pointed out to me, since we carried out experiments in a hotel room, it should really be in suito rather than 
Yeah, maybe you can have a And um, then I would like to thank um, Indamped and Kyriakos Lactos for providing insight into experimental design and into experiment, primarily experiments before I went and after I went on the field trip. I would like to thank Eric Lauder for his insight into the mathematical modeling and in particular, how one might think about modeling the locomotion of an individual worm. And I would like to thank, of course, my supervisor, Ray Goldstein, for his insight at every step along the way. And finally, I would like to thank you, the audience, for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this talk and I'll be very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. It was a very lovely talk. Uh, so uh, please write your questions in the chat. Uh, there's already one, so I start from there. Uh, could you please, so thanks for the beautiful talk. Could you please elaborate on kinetics of meal formation? That is uh, starting from a uniform suspension. How does the larger scale soil form? So, so yes, I think what I've talked about today is more the dynamics of when we have a mill which has already formed, but there is a second set of problems in trying to understand how an individual uh, mill forms from just in situ and worms swimming around, which is something which we're looking at currently. Um, but, but yeah, but I think one can definitely, but it, the uh, initial mill forms due to sort of local interaction between individual worms. Okay, I also had a related question actually. Uh, is there any particular critical concentration of worms that you need to get the, to get the mill. So uh, I assume it's um, So definitely there is a critical, there is a critical concentration in the sense that if you had a very small number, um, then you definitely don't see the onset of circular mills, but I, it hasn't been sort of quantified in that I'm not exactly sure exactly um, what the right number is, because I feel that one of the difficulties of trying to understand the um, how we form a circular mill is that it's not just a passive process. Um, the worms are um, developed enough that there is some aspect of sort of an active process in this formation as well. But I think there definitely is a critical um, threshold. Sure. Uh, there's another question in the chat asking, uh, what is the experimental initial conditions in the petri dishes before the mill forms? Um, so, okay, so in the experimental design, we had a petri dish of water, and then we put in using a pipette um, a large number of worms, but we made sure it just had sort of a uniform concentration across, and we just left the system to evolve. Mm -hmm. So, essentially, it's sort of a, a uniform, constant concentration across the petri dish. Well, oh, there's one from uh, Paul. Are these meals stable? So, some Mills which are closer, which form, which are close to the center of the petri dish are stable and we can see that they can sort of yeah, stay for many hours. But for mills which are quite far away from the center of the petri dish, we often see that secondary mills emerge and that's because it's a secondary mill. That's because the flow generated by the first mill has a stagnation point and so a secondary mill can form in that stagnation point. So I think the question, so I think the answer is yes and no. It depends on the location of where the circular mill is in the arena. And if you if one increases the complexity of the arena, even from just a circle to say a tray, as I showed in a sort of a diagram, you can get a lot more and um, complicated. Um, stability structures of multiple mills of different sizes and um, being stable with each other. So I think it, it depends on where a certain mill is in the petri dish and also what the exact type of what the boundary conditions are and what the shape of the boundary. Uh, how does the flow field of a single plant uh, animal worm uh, will look like qualitatively? So as I showed just earlier, um, what we see is, is it's um, one, it, it decays like one over um, r cubed. So essentially, it's it's very similar to uh, to a neutral sort of squirma in the sense that um, it just decays quite rapidly away from the worm. Or the many species actually that form such meals. So we have only. This is a really good question, and we've only. Um, I think at this lamp scale, 
i.e. in sort of the centimetre lamp scale, I'm only aware of this particular um, sort of species of organism which forms these structures. Um, but, but there could quite feasibly be other um, organisms um, because fundamentally yeah, because uh, because fundamentally, I think that there's there's quite there must be just of other organisms of which it's of it's a benefit to collectively group together like this. Yeah, I mean, which relates actually to the next question about uh, uh, how much we know about biological motivations or physiological relevance of uh, such meals formation. Um, so again, that's a very good question, and um, it's believed that in this context. The, um, as well as um, having you see, the benefits which I've sort of talked about in this talk, which are more fluid dynamical related, i.e. reducing the fluid velocity field, which um, sends waste products away and allowing them to passively organise towards the arena centre. We also believe that more biologically, when we have very, in on the beach, um, these organisms live um, very socially in very large communities of many hundreds of thousands. So this, uh, this might allow them to um, group into a structure so that they can all see, so they can all sort of see the light and hence as a collective light. If they were just randomly swimming around, then they would not be as efficient in packing in say a certain rock pool. So this allows them to um, collectively sort of form themselves into a nice pattern so that all of them can see the light and hence all of their um, respective algae can photosynthesize and support them. So I think the key thing about this organism is that uh, um, fundamentally they rely completely on the algae. So if you kill the algae, mm -hmm. then you kill the worm. So all of its life cycle is devoted to, um, to keeping these algae alive in a part of a beach, which is a foreshore, which is typically underwater um, for a few hours before and after high tide. So essentially, the tide comes in, they blow into the sand, then the tide comes out, they come up, photosynthesize with the algae, and then they repeat that cycle. So I do think that it's, it's related to both photosynthesis, so that photosynthesis is so key to their, um, their survival as a species. Yeah. 